Good. Okay, my name is Merle. I'm a volunteer at Book Fair. I want to welcome you and um, just let you know that we are thrilled that you're here. Uh, this is, we're winding down this weekend, and thank God the sun came out, so we're very happy, very happy. Um, just a few things. First of all, any friends? I mean, any uh, friends of the... Yes. Thank you very much, friends. If anybody else wants to be a friend, you can go online and do that for the next year. There are ongoing activities throughout the year through the book fair, but this is the festival. This is the grand finale for us. Um, we'd like to also thank our sponsors who have been very kind at supporting us. And um, what else? Um, the After the authors <coughs> get done with their presentations, There'll be book signing downstairs in the red zone. I'll be very happy to take you down there when, it's, when their presentations are done, and you can sign their books. And if anybody has a cell phone that's on, would you kindly shut it off? And I'm going to now present our presenter. Judge William Thomas is going to come up and lead the show. All right, go for it. Now. Now, I'm not the main attraction here today, but I need to feel the love, too. So Judge William Thomas, can I hear from me? All right, thank you all. Thank you all so much. Uh, I am one of your 123 elected circuit court judges here in Miami-Dade County. I know I look a lot younger, but I've been a judge for about uh, 11 years now and love what I do, love what I do, and you need to know that all 123 of your circuit court judges, we work hard to instill confidence in you so that you would have the confidence in what it is that we do. We work hard and we want you all to remember that we do work hard and we are elected. That's the important point. You put us where we are. So when you go down the ballot form, don't skip us, okay? Try to get to know who we are, all right. Now, this is all about these three very, very distinguished authors who are sitting here today. The way we're going to do the presentation is, is we're gonna go down the uh, line and each one is going to present as they see fit. They all have the same amount of time and after each have done their presentations, we will then open it up to the floor for any questions or comments anyone would like to make. But as you all know, when someone is doing a presentation, they want to feel that the people they're presenting to hear them and you're engaged with what they're doing. So if you hear something you like and you want to actually, ooh, ah, or you want to just say something to let them know that you're hearing it and you like that portion of what it is that they said, I promise you they would appreciate it and it won't throw them too much off of their normal presentation. Um, <laughs> And immediately after, immediately after um, the last person has presented, who I think the last person presenting would be Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson, um, immediately after they are done, we are encouraging you all with as much enthusiasm as you can muster to come to the microphones and ask whatever questions you wanna ask and share whatever comments you wanna share. That having been said, because we don't have a lot of time, Let's start. We're speaking first, the first presenter speaking is Mr. Paget Powell. And this is always the uncomfortable part because he has to sit here and listen to me tell you how great he is, okay? He has to appear to be humbled by all of the good things that I'm saying. Um, Mr. Powell is the author of six novels, including the, um, the interrogative, their interrogative Mood and Adesto, which was a finalist for the National Book Award, and two collections of stories. His writings has appeared in the New Yorker, Harper's, and the Paris Review. He has received a Whiting Writers Award, the Rome Fellowship in Literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and the James Tate Black Memorial Prize. Powell co-directs and teaches at MFA at FLA, the writing program of the University of Florida in Gainesville. Paget Powell's new collection, Cries for Help, um, various stories follows his mentor Donald, help me with the last name? Bartholomew. Bartholomew. Um, advice that wacky mode must break their hearts. 
the surrealist and, com uh, and the comical terrain of most of the 44 stories here is grounded by a real preoccupation with longing, fear, work, loneliness, and cultural nostalgia. Please welcome Mr. Paget Powell. Thank you, William. I was not anticipating a Lucite podium, hence my short pants are exposed. <laughs> and there's even a tear that I, I know I'm in Florida. Uh, I uh, elected to go first because I, I'm going to lower the debate, as Flannery O'Connor liked to put it, and I'd like to second William's sentiment that literature is not church. The proper subtitle, the original subtitle for this book, was not stories, but 45 failed novels. <laughs> I discovered that that subtitle makes a publisher, uh, even a new publisher, uh, perhaps particularly a new publisher, nervous. And they threw it out at the last minute and came up with the searing substitute stories, <laughs> which is fraudulent because these are not stories, properly speaking. They are failed novels, and I'm going to prove it. <laughs> this is a failed novel called The Retarded Hermit. The hermit knew he was illiterate, but had not thought in the beginning that illiterate necessarily also imputed retarded. As he got deeper into the hermitage and more dim-witted when he infrequently ran into people, he began to sense that retardation was actually part of the deal with him. He realized that he had always been stupid, but that his energy as a youth had been sufficient that he had been able to mask stupidity with avidity. As his avidity waned, he saw clearly the stupidity that had been underneath it all along, like the mud flat that is under a receding tide. The happy, frisky, bright blue waters drew slowly off, leaving a dull, flat plain of mud. This was his brain. That is not a propitious beginning to a novel. <laughs> this one limped on for another four and a half pages to its natural conclusion of complete hopelessness. <laughs> now I'm going to read you a whole failed novel from beginning to end provided I can find it, which for some reason always proves tricky. Now I'm a little, I'm a little out of sorts uh, other than wearing torn pants because some of you may not know this, but Mr. Johnson about three days ago won the big prize, the National Book Award. <laughs> And it, it's hard to read with all the, the air sucked out of the room by, <laughs> by a better person. <laughs> this is called Utopia. A man in a cigar-colored suit is not to be trusted, and frankly, my aversion to that one over there goes well beyond mistrust. I outright do not like the son of a bitch a cigar-colored suit. I am pursuing my dissertation on agiation. That is the new science of getting old. In case you need to know what I am talking about, you probably don't. Sometimes I myself wonder why anyone needs to know anything about agiation, when for thousands of years people just did it without being told a goddamn thing about it, and they got along fine getting old right on schedule, and getting in their final pajamas, etc. I wonder why anyone needs to know anything about anything when you get right down to it. In the same spirit of wonderment, I wonder why everyone has to suddenly be on the phone all the time. 
Everyone has suddenly decided they have to know what everyone else is up to at every minute of the day. How did this happen? We have all become the president. There is a new society forming. It is going to allow only running water in a house, a three-channel TV, a rotary dial phone, a ringer washing machine, and one car. When the cigar-colored suit-wearing asshole is not wearing that, he is wearing a sky blue one. It would be fun and gratifying to see a car knock him out of his shoes. There they would sit, some kind of Italian superiority, empty on the road, nearby which groans the lump who wore them to that forlorn spot. The ambulance might be forever in coming. What will become of the shoes? I despise that asshole. I would hope that a bum would come along and fit himself into the shoes and shamble off in them, perhaps right by the paralyzed face of the owner who could just force himself to groan, my shoes. <laughs> yeah, now, the bum says, I clicking and clacking down the track now. I stopped that novel right there. <laughs> on a up note. <laughs> before it had time to get characteristically maudlin. All right, this one went on a little bit. If I reach my limits, stop me. Someone just say halt, and I will. The odds that Mrs. Fiberung were to retire that day after 30 years of service and set her car on fire inadvertently and narrowly preserve the Girl Scout cookies from its trunk and mosey on home eating them with great satisfaction and get there and find her son cavorting in the swimming pool with a girl when she had theretofore thought him uninterested in girls, and a letter of foreclosure on the house, and two lizards either fighting or mating on the kitchen table, and a volleyball net inexplicably strung in the backyard, and a complete inability to recall her husband and the nastiness of the divorce, and a strange and harmless man slumped in a corner of her garage, whom she shooed away without calling the police, which was probably against principles of bourgeois suburban protocol, was incalculable. <laughs> Were incalculable. The odds. Who wished to calculate anything these days anyway? Who broached the notion of odds and their calculability? Her car was on fire. Her son was in the pool with a girl. Lizards were going at it on the table. The cookies were good. She felt better about life in general than she had in years. This is a gift horse not to look in the mouth or the rear end either for that matter. Let it be lame, accept it. She called her son in and his girlfriend and they stood there apprehensively dripping on the carpet, shivering a little. Their shoulders narrowed under their towels, which were draped over them. Cavorting in the pool like that with no one here to chaperone you will make the neighbors talk, she said. Go up to your room. The girl looked from her to her son incredulously and then followed her son, who had already started up, to his room. Mrs. Fiberung hoped they took full advantage of this chaperoning. She was an expert militant chaperone and believed in the full exercise of the seditious power a chaperone was in position to wield. While she had thought her son homosexual, she had of course maintained there was nothing really wrong in that, but she now discovered a very strong sense of relief in herself, almost a joy, a high that she sought to confirm and prolong and deepen by sending the two of them to a private room. They were nearly pickled by the chlorinated water anyway, she had noticed. She put on a trench coat her husband had left and modeled in it before a full-length mirror, looking like a spy. Some odd words and ideas came nearly to her mind that she could not completely grasp or assemble. 
furtive Clature was one of them. She took that thought out to the pool and got in a chaise, still in the coat with a drink, and found that furtive Clature had shifted to Newman Bowles or Newman Bolus. These entities in her head, whatever they were, suggested to her the idea that she wanted to become a radically different person from that she had been to this point in her life. Was that possible? Or was it only an idea that everyone entertained once in a while and, like these oddball words, could not quite really possess or effect? Did the urge just not leave you, like these new words, incomplete and unformed and undefined? Was it not the case, for example, that in launching into a new you, you typically got about as far as drinking by your pool in a spy coat in the middle of the afternoon and hoping your son was seizing the day upstairs in his bedroom? Was it not more likely that the two of them would be regarding her now through the slit blinds of that room and speculating as to what was wrong with her? and that soon she would abandon the, po the poolside chaise and return the coat to its hangar and be back exactly to herself after the girl went home properly unmolested. I suggest we leave Mrs. Fiberung upon the horns of her little dilemma on the grounds that she is as capable as we are of solving what are, after all, her trivial problems. We have problems of our own we might be better advised to inspect. To the extent they too are trivial, we might well advise our own self to abjure them too. To hell with Mrs. Fiberung and her little problems. And to hell with us and our little problems. And let us get on with it. The odd volleyball net is before us beside the pool that Mrs. Fiberung has quit. Husbands do leave. Boys do stray. Girls do play. The wide world of sports will cover about anything. Buttocks. Buttocks in spandex. Before the buttocks develop that large curd cottage cheese dimpling, one of the saddest things on earth, and one of God's chief oversights. <laughs> On the other hand, the buttocks before the curding is one of his proudest moments, and indeed, one of the signal arguments for his existence. <laughs> to see him working his way toward the human buttock, whether with the hand of the Darwinian selector or not, traveling from the hairy hind of quadrupeds to the fulgent, obscene, turquoise and carmine noise of the baboon's operatic ass to the smooth, domed, cleaved, in the beginning, firm as jello and perfect for spanking human buttocks is to see a great mind at work <laughs> and to place the buttocks in that relation to the shitty rump of an ox or to the cloaca of the slithering beast is not less than placing the sun in relation to a planet. Because of the butt, God exists. I have a butt or had a butt. Therefore, I am the son of God. That novel ended right there. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And uh, don't storm out. The books will be there. Doesn't that make you want to go and just buy? You want to know more. You want to read more. Because the personality that's associated with the words that we don't always see come right off the pages. I, lo I love that. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Powell. Now, we're going to hear from Kelly Link. Kelly Link is the author of Get in Trouble, Stranger Things Happen, Magic for Beginners, and Pretty Monsters. She is the co-founder of Small Beer Press. Her short stories have been published in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, The Best American Short Stories, 
and prize stories. The O. Henry Awards. Link has been hailed um, by Michael Chabon as the most darkly playful voice in American fiction and by Neil Gaiman, did I say it right? Yeah. Gaiman, Neil Gaiman as a national treasure. Get in Trouble, stories from Random House, Link's eagerly awaited new collection, her first for adult readers in a decade, proves indelibly that this bewitching original writer is among the finest we have. Put your hands together, please, for Miss Kelly Link. Two mics. Um, also, I've never seen a Lucite podium before. Feels very Miami, but but sort of maybe from the from the early 90s, I like it. So I'm gonna read from the start of a story called I Can See Right Through You, um, just a couple of pages. When the sex tape happened and things went south with Fawn, the demon lover did what he always did, he went to cry on Maggie's shoulder. Girls like Fawn came and went, but Maggie would always be there. Him and Maggie, it was the talisman you kept in your pocket, the one you couldn't lose. Two monsters can kiss in a movie. One old friend can go to see another old friend and be sure of his welcome. So here's the demon lover in a rental car. An hour into the drive, he opens the window of the rental car, tosses out his cell phone. There is no one he wants to talk to except for Maggie. 1991. This is after the movie and after they are together and after they begin to understand the bargain that they have made. They are both suddenly very famous. Film can be put together in any order, scenes shot in any order of sequence. Take as many takes as you like. Continuity is independent of linear time. Sometimes you aren't even in the scene together. Maggie says her lines to your stand-in. They'll splice you together later on. Shuffle off to Buffalo Gals, come out tonight. This is long before any of that. This was a very long time ago. Maggie tells the demon lover a story. Two girls, and look, they've found a Ouija board. They make a list of questions. One girl is pretty, one girl is not really a part of this story. She's lost her favorite sweater. Two girls, each touching lightly the planchette. Is anyone here? Where did I put my blue sweater? Will anyone ever love me? Things like that. They ask their questions, the planchette drifts, they start the list over again. Is anyone here? Will I be famous? Where is my blue sweater? The planchette jerks under their fingers. M. E. Maggie says, did you do that? The other girl says she didn't. M, E, G, Maggie. It's talking to you, the other girl says. M, E, G, Maggie, hello. Maggie says, hello. The planchette moves, there's something animal about it. H, E, L, hello, I am with you. I am with you, always. They write it all down. M, E, G, Maggie, O, I will love you always. Who is this, she says, who are you? I, S, E, I, C, U. A pause, then, I, W, I, I will, Maggie, O, I will be with you always. Are you doing this, Maggie says the other girl. She shakes her head. M, E, G, Maggie, wait. The other girl says, I just want to know where my sweater is. <laughs> o, W, A, I, O, wait, and I will come. They wait. Will there be a knock at the bedroom door? But no one comes. No one is coming. I, A, M, I am with you always. No one is here with them. The sweater will never be found. The other girl grows up, lives a long and happy life. Maggie goes out to L.A. and meets the demon lover. W-A-I-T. After that, the only thing the planchette says over and over is Maggie's name. It's all very romantic. 1974, 22 people disappear from a nudist colony in Lake Apopka. People disappear all the time. Let's be honest, the only thing interesting here is that these people were naked and that no one ever saw them again. Funny, right? 1990. It's one of the 10 most iconic movie kisses of all time in the top five, surely. You and Maggie, the demon lover and his monster girl vampire sharing a kiss as the sun comes up. 
Both of you wearing so much makeup, it still astonishes you that anyone would ever recognize you on the street. It's hard for the demon lover to grow old. Florida is California on a trauma budget. That's what the demon lover thinks anyway. Special effects blew the budget on bugs and bad weather. He parks in a meadowy space recently mowed alongside other rental cars, the usual catering and equipment vans. There are two gate posts with a chain between them, no fence, eternal I endure. There's an evil <coughs> smell. Does it belong to the place or to him? The demon lover sniffs under his arm. It's an end of the world sky, a snakes and ladders landscape, low emerald trees pulled lower by vines, chalk and apricot anthills. The demon lover imagines the bones of a nudist under every one. Shallow water-filled declivities scummed with algae, lime and gold and black. The blot of the lake, that's another theory, the lake. A storm is coming. He doesn't get out of his car. He rolls the window down and watches the storm come in. Let's look at him, looking at it, a pretty thing admiring a pretty thing. Abandoned sight of a mass disappearance, muddy violet clouds, silver veils of rain driving down the lake, the tabloid prince of darkness, Maggie's demon lover arriving in all his splendor. The only things to spoil it are the bugs and the sex tape. 2012, you have been famous for more than half of your life, both of you. You only made the one movie together, but people still stop you on the street to ask about Maggie. Is she happy? Sometimes they don't ask about Maggie, instead they ask if you will bite them. Happiness, misery, if you were one, bet on it, the other was on the way. That was what everyone liked to see. It was what the whole thing was about. The demon lover has a pair of gold cufflinks, those faces. Maggie gave them to him. You know the ones I mean. 2010, Maggie and the demon lover throw a Halloween party for everyone they know. They do this every Halloween. They're famous for it. Year after year, on a monkey's face, a monkey face, Maggie says, she's King Kong, the year before half a pantomime horse. He's the demon lover. Who else? Year after year. Maggie says, I've decided to give up acting. I'm going to be a poet. Nobody cares when poets get old. Fawn says, appraisingly, I hope I look half as good as you when I'm your age. Fawn, 23, a makeup artist. This year, she and the demon lover are married. Last year, they met on set. He says, I'm thinking I could get some work done on my jawline. You'd think they were mother and daughter, same Viking profile, same quizzical tilt to the head when they turned to look at him, both taller than him, both smarter too, no doubt about it. Maybe Maggie wonders sometimes about the woman he sleeps with, marries. Maybe he has a type, but so does she. There's a guy at the Halloween party, a boy really. Maggie always has a boy and the demon lover can always pick him out. Easy enough, even if Maggie's sly. She never introduces the lover of the moment, never even acknowledges their presence. They hang out on the edge of whatever is, whatever is happening and drink or smoke and watch Maggie at the center. Sometimes they drift closer, stand near enough to Maggie that it's plain what's going on. When she leaves, they follow after. Maggie's type, the funny thing is, Maggie's lovers all look like the demon lover. More like the demon lover, he admits it, than he does. He and Maggie are both older now, but the world is full of beautiful black-haired boys and golden girls. Really, that's the problem. The role of the demon lover comes with certain obligations. Your hairline will not recede. Your waistline will not expand. You are not to be photographed, threatening paparazzi, or in sweatpants, no sex tapes. Your fans will offer their necks at premieres, also at restaurants and at the bank, more than once when he is standing in front of a urinal. Ask if you will bite their wives, their daughters. They will cut themselves with a razor in front of you. The appropriate reaction is, there is no appropriate reaction. The demon lover does not always live up to his obligations. There is a sex tape. There's a girl with a piercing. There is, in the middle of some athletic sex, a comical incident involving his foreskin. There's blood all over the sheets. There's a lot of blood. There's a 911 call. There's him fainting, falling, and hitting his head on a bedside table. There's Prez Hilton, Gawker, Talk Radio, YouTube, Tumblr. There are gifts. You will always be most famous for playing the lead in a series of vampire movies. The character you play is, of course, ageless, but you get older. The first time you bite a girl's neck, Maggie's neck, you're a 25-year-old old actor playing a vampire who hasn't gotten a day older in 300 years. Now you're a 49-year-old actor playing the same ageless vampire. It's getting to be a little ridiculous, isn't it? But if the demon lover isn't the demon lover, then who is he? Who are you? Other projects disappoint. Your agent says, take a comic role. The trouble is you're not very funny. You're not good at funny. The other trouble is the sex tape. Sex tapes are inherently funny. Nudity is regrettably funny. Torn foreskins are painfully funny. You didn't know she was filming it. Your agent says, 
that wasn't what I meant. When the sex tape happens, you say to Fawn, but what does this have to do with Maggie? This has nothing to do with Maggie, it was just some girl. It's not like there haven't been other girls. Fawn says, it has everything to do with Maggie. I can see right through you, Fawn says, less in sorrow than in anger. She probably can. And hasn't it been in the back of your mind all this time? It was Maggie right at the start. Why shouldn't it be Maggie again? And in the meantime, you could get married once in a while and never worry about whether or not it worked out. He and Maggie have managed all this time to stay friends. His marriages, his other relationships, perhaps these have only been a series of delaying actions, small rebellions. And here's the thing about his marriages. He's never managed to stay friends with his ex-wives, his exes. He and Fawn won't be friends. The demon lover and Maggie have known each other for such a long time. No one knows him like Maggie. The remains of the nudist colony at Lake Apopka promised reasonable value for ghost hunters. A dozen ruined cabins, some roofless, windows black with mildew, a crumbled stucco hall, Spanish tiles receding, cracked lip of a slop-filled pool. Between the cabins and the lake, the homely and welcome sight of half a dozen trailers, even better, he spots a craft tent. Muck farms, mutant alligators, disappearing nudists, the demon lover killing time in the LAX airport, read up on Lake Apopka. The past is a weird place, Florida's a weird place, no news there. A demon lover should fit right in, but the ground sucks and clots at his shoes in a way that suggests he isn't welcome. The rain is directly overhead now, shouting down in spit warm gouts. He begins to run, stumbling in the direction of the craft tent. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Link. Now, our last presenter before we'll be able to engage the authors directly is Adam Johnson. Adam Johnson is the author of The Orphan Master's Son, winner of the Pulitzer, Pri Pulitzer Prize in Fiction, the Dayton Literacy Peace Prize, and the California Book Award, and finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Johnson's other awards include a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Whiting Writers Award, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, and a, is it Stegner? Stegner. Stegner, Stegner Fellowship, as he was also a finalist for the New York Public Literary Young Lions Award. He's, his previous books are Emporium, a short story collection, and a novel, Parasites Like Us. Johnson teaches creative writing at Stanford University and lives in San Francisco with his wife and children. Please welcome Mr. Johnson to the stage. <laughs> Greetings. Hello, everyone. Where's Judge Walker when we need him? How come none of my judges have been so amazing? Um, you're right, it is a strange loose sights thing to be behind. It's a great honor to uh, be here um, at the Miami Book Fair. I love the, this fair. The first time I came was in like 2002. Paget, how many times have you, have you been to this book fair? I'm a virgin. Really? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, so, uh, because I was a grad student at Florida State University. Um, so, uh, it's a real honor uh, particularly to be here with Paget Powell, uh, a writer I admire, a writer who influ influenced an entire generation of writers, uh, and with Kelly Link, a writer I love and whose work I've taught and thrilled students with at Stanford. Uh, I'm going to read uh, four pages um, from uh, deep in a story. Uh, it won't make probably any sense to you. Um, it's a story I haven't read from in a long time, because uh, you'll see why. Um, but it's Sunday afternoon, right? And, you know. What the heck? Um, this story's called Dark Meadow. And um, I, you know, I don't really need to set it up. <clears throat> Our narrator lives in LA. And uh, next door live two girls. He calls them the tiger and the cub. The two girls call him Mr. Roses because of his gardening. And um, Mr. Roses is attracted to the cub. <clears throat> The next day, the tiger and the cub are having a yard sale. They sit at a table covered with household goods. The tiger is wearing gym shorts and a jeans jacket. The cub has on a red hand-me-down hoodie. When I approach the table, I ask, why aren't you guys in school? The cub says, it's Saturday, Mr. Roses. 
This is the closest I've been to the cub. There is no single trait that makes her activate. It's not the brown ringlets or the baby fat cheeks or the exaggerated expressions. It's just the cusp she's on. I can see her face a wide-eyed, trusting openness. She directs this look to a world that is yet to reveal its dark and unapologetic nature. Part of me wants to kill the person who manages to steal this look from her, and a loathsome, unfathomable part of me thinks it's only natural to be the thief. When I let my gaze fall upon a power juicer, the tiger says, it's like new, we never even used it. And when I look at a waffle iron, the cub forlornly lifts her eyebrows and says only, waffles. Are you guys trying to save up for something, I asked them? Just making ends meet, the tiger says. They are eating slices of frozen French toast straight from the box. I look over at their apartment, the door standing open. Is your mom sleeping, I ask them. The cub says, she's on tour with a band. Well, what band is this, I ask. We forget, the tiger says, and we can't check mom's blog. The internet's not working. The cable, too. The cub adds, is your internet working, the tiger asks. I don't have the internet, I tell them. The tiger nods in sympathy. Anyway, she says, the band is going to be the next Nirvana. Do you know when your mother's coming back, I ask, are you in contact with her? Yeah, the tiger says. We texted her and she texted back. She said we shouldn't worry about her, that she's just fine. <laughs> the cub holds up a clock radio. Five bucks, she says. It beams the time on the ceiling. No thanks, I say. The sad part, the tiger says, is that our, fa our place is filled with rock memorabilia. It's priceless, the cub says. But we can't sell any of it, the tiger says, because it's priceless, the cub says. Then she adds, my dad is a rock star. Mine too, the tiger says. But her dad is seriously famous, like sellout stadiums famous. He sends us a check every month, which is why we don't have to work. I look at some of their things, a bathroom scale, a pop-up Polaroid camera, a lamp. I try to remember how long it's been since I've laid eyes on their mother. I always have to buy something at a yard sale, I tell them. It's an addiction I have. Well, what about a picture, the cub asks. From behind the table, she lifts a painting of a boat upon a moonlit velvet sea. The wooden frame is hand-carved and darkly stained. It's the kind of painting you see Mexican guys selling at stoplights on Sepulveda. The tiger says, I think it's a clipper ship. Actually, it's a sloop, I tell her. A Bermuda sloop, rigged to sail alone. You a sailor, the cub asks. I used to sail, I say. I haven't in a long time. But it's easy to tell the ships apart. You just look at the sails and count the mass. It goes sloop, cutter, catch, schooner, clipper. The tiger says, now you have to buy it. It's a fine painting, I say, and scratch my chin. Probably worth more than I can afford. The girls look at one another. Make us an offer, the tiger says. I open my wallet and look inside. I pull out those three $100 bills. This is the best I can do, I tell them. After darkness falls, I sit on my small porch and read the latest National Geographic magazine. Somehow, without my really noticing it, the tiger and the cub appear before me. The tiger says, some guy was looking in our window. He was scary, the cub says. We heard a noise, the tiger says, and when we looked up, there he was. Everything's going to be fine, I tell them. Come, let's have a look. We cross the parking lot to their one-bedroom apartment. Inside, the walls are covered with album covers and symbols autographed in black marker. The tiger's mom has the bedroom, so the girls sleep on the floor in front of the television. Where did you see him? I asked them. They point at the window above a small breakfast table. I heard someone say there was a, a peeper in the neighborhood. What's a peeper, the cub asks. He's a guy, I say. He's a fellow who likes. What a peeper does is he looks in your windows, the tiger says. Oh, the cub says. Why would he do that? The tiger looks at me, wondering if she should explain, and I shake my head. Wait here, I tell them. 
Outside, I make my way to the back of the complex, squeezing between the trash bins and dryer vents as I traverse the apartment's rear wall. Here, I cup my hands to the glass and peer inside, observing the girls the way a pervert would. When the cub looks my direction, she screams, and then the tiger screams, and then they realize it's only me. I move to inspect the bedroom window. Below the frame, the, glass has been, the grass has been trampled, and someone has ejaculated many times onto the pink stucco. Nearing the glass, I gaze into the mother's bedroom. Here is the mattress where the tiger's mom sleeps off her hangovers, where, out cold, sheets bald, robe flopped open, she spends her days. Inside, I tell the girls that some guy just probably looked in the wrong window. Still, we hang towels over both panes. The girls are happy to have a visitor. The tiger shows me her tiger dance. The cub, too, performs for me. She begins to move about the apartment like a dolphin. Her elbows become fins. Her, she puffs out her cheeks and holds her breath. When she lifts her head, she's breaching the surface. And when her neck lowers, she's diving deep. And she is not running through dirty laundry. She is swimming in the open ocean. In this faraway sea, alcohol doesn't exist. And neither do North Hollywood one bedrooms. Here, men don't fuck groupies or masturbate while your mother dreams. I watch the cub swim laps around me, her limber young limbs silently circling, wholly unaware of the designs the world has drafted for her. When her eyes lift to mine, seeking my approval, I call a halt to this swimming and dancing business. I go to their fridge, which is papered with nightclub flyers. Inside I find nothing, not even milk. Are you hungry, Mr. Roses, the cub asks. Well, what happened to the money I gave you for the painting, I ask. The tiger says, we had to pay a bill. Well, what bill was this? The tiger says, a guy came by. He knows our mom, and it turns out there was a bill she forgot to say, forgot to pay. Wait here, I tell them, and I head to the 7-Eleven on the corner. I buy whole grain cereal, bananas, and a gallon of milk. Behind the checkout counter are racks of dirty magazines. I turn from them. I feel like a good guy in this moment, like a normal guy who has normal interactions with others. The cub is a powerful force. She activates, but I feel strong and good. I deliver the groceries, and when I take leave of the girls, I stand on the front step, and I tell them to close the door and to lock it. I want to hear it lock, I tell them. They close the door, but instead of locking it, they say, what are we supposed to do? Read a book, I say through the wood. Better yet, go to bed. Now lock the door. They are quiet a moment. Then the deadbolt locks. At home, I hang the painting where I can see it from my bed. I lay atop my covers, thinking about the guy who is sailing alone. The lights are off, but there's enough glow through the windows that I see the weight and size of the ocean rollers to note how the rigging strains in the wind. The sailor is looking toward a dark horizon, so the viewer can't see his face, but it's easy to tell his story is an old one. A sailor has lost something far out at sea. Now he's heading back to claim it. It's just a cheap painting, but I wonder if the sailor can get this thing back, if he can find the place where he lost it. To do that, he must sail back in time to before. The journey is impossible, but he has his boat rigged right, and the rope is in his hands. The wind is up, and he is bow fronting the waves. Most important, the sailor has made the decision. He has embarked. All right, now what we're going to do, um, and hopefully we'll have a good interaction and a good exchange, is we're going to open up the floor for you all to ask whatever questions you want to ask of these uh, fine authors. And they, of course, will answer what they choose to answer. Um, does anyone have any questions? If so, could you just please just make your way to the microphone there in the center? Um, if not, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of their passions, but we're hoping that 
someone here just has a burning question that they want to ask the authors that you don't mind asking in front of uh, maybe 50 other people. Doesn't even have to be that burning. It could be more of a Yeah, there you go. Doesn't even have to. <laughs> Anybody? Hi, my question is for, is for Mr. Johnson and Orphan Master's son. Uh, if I can broach from uh, the new one back to that one. You made the main guy just, I really liked him. I really felt for him, but he was somebody who kidnapped people and killed people. When you were writing that, did you go through any drafts or did you wonder about how I'm going to make people like him, even though he's, doing, he's the best guy in North Korea? I absolutely adored him, but he's vicious. Right. Can you talk a little bit about just creating him? Um, well, if you started kidnapping and killing people, I would still like you. I can tell you're a very thoughtful and smart fellow. Um, uh, well, that's a, the question of likable characters, I think, is one we can, you know, all ad all address, perhaps. Um, I have I have felt that, you know, there are a few trends in publishing that I, I don't like, and one of them is the rise of the likable character. I think there um, has been kind of... Um, a Hollywoodization of publishing to some degree. Um, the must-see blockbuster book that takes up all the oxygen in the room <laughs> and uh, everyone must read Gone Girl or whatever the book is. Um, and uh, the debut uh, is, uh, I wish that wasn't s s weighted so heavily uh, out of New York publishing. But this, I think there is um, a a, too big of an emphasis on likable characters. I think they're selected for uh, by editors who want to achieve certain sales goals, who want to achieve certain audiences, and I feel like that excises a few um, uh, em modes of emotionality out of the full range of the human spectrum. That we just see some things less. I think anger, we see less angry characters that way. Um, bitter and jealous characters, I think we see less of uh, when a lot of us are angry, bitter, and jealous and at some times. And maybe that's the most interesting part of part of our lives. Um, so uh, make sure to buy some angry, violent, bitter books. Kelly, what do you think of this topic? You know, I think that um, what draws you to a particular book or a particular character is not necessarily whether or not they are somebody who is doing good things. I think it's, do they want something that we can identify with? Um, and oftentimes, if they seem, if, if you have a character, and it's not to say that you can't write a book about somebody who is a good person in, in every single aspect, but uh, even people who I think are, are good people have, have um, complicated sides, one of the things that I usually think about if I'm writing a character is who is the person that they want to be to the rest of the world, who is the person that they feel like that they are on, on the inside, because I think that those are not necessarily the same person, and so one of the pleasures of fiction is you get in people's heads, and so you get to see the intersection of the kind of people that people are with their families at work um, when they're in the pursuit of something that they will do anything to get. I think that those are, uh, in, in story turns, those are all things that provoke narrative. They make things happen. Um, and characters who do really large things, uh, including kidnapping and murdering people, they're interesting because they're, they're doing stuff that probably we don't do in, in our own lives. But if somebody says to you, can I tell you a story about a murderer? You say, yes. If I say, can I tell you a story about the neighbor who lives next door to me and, you know, who mows my lawn? It's not, you know, you're not going to think, yes, I would really like to hear that story. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. And if you're not comfortable going to the microphone, just you can yell your question out where you are and I'll repeat it to the extent that I can hear it. I just have a question for all three of you. Where do you write? And how do you find the time and the ability to concentrate and to write? Especially Mr. Johnson, because they mentioned you have children, and I imagine they're young children, given that you look so young. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I do, we live in San Francisco, so our house is small. Uh, I have three kids and we have a guest in the house. Mm -hmm. We have a foster child right now. That meant uh, uh, that my son had to move into the living room and we also have a dog and a blind dog and an angry cockatoo. <laughs> our house is very crazy. Um, and I don't, I don't really have a space. Um, there's a, a, hosp a teaching hospital called UCSF, not too far from me, about a mile, and um, I write in the library of a, of a medical, um, I write in a medical library, which is really cool. It's doctors and homeless people and me. And uh, the most important thing is that they, I don't, they have a Wi-Fi system, but I don't have access to it. So I just go and I, I write a great deal there. Um, I live in a, in a town in Western Mass, um, and I don't like working by myself. I like to, to be in a place. I'm fairly social when I work, less social when I'm not working. Um, and there are a couple of writers in my, in my area. Uh, both of them are young adult writers, a writer named Holly Black and a writer named Cassandra Clare. And we are all social writers. We all meet up. We work in each other's houses or in cafes, and I find having other people who work very hard in the same room as me means that I work a little bit harder too. And I have a kid, so I swap off with my husband in terms of we both, uh, depending on who has a bigger pile of work, uh, do, the, do the staying at, at home, uh, taking care of a kid. But people, I mean people, I mean the thing is people make space for themselves different way. I'm, there's a writer whose work I love Margo Lanigan, for years, um, she wrote on, she commuted on a train. So she would write on the train on the way to work and on the way back, and that was her writing time. Um, and so I think oftentimes you just have to experiment until you find how to make use of what time you have. It makes me angry if we all have to answer the same question. <laughs> I, I, I have children, and I murdered them, and they don't pester me anymore. The one who survived the murder was on Chicago PD last week. Uh, if, if you'd like to see her, she's gorgeous. Uh, the murdering was incomplete. Uh, you know, Tennessee Williams, not far from here in Key West, famously wrote about getting up at 5 a.m. still drunk from Troppo Vino and breaking his silex of coffee as he crossed the patio to his little studio. And uh, the moral of this little vignette is write as you may, do it. If you want to write, you will. Get your stuff, do it. Nobody else's prescription is going to be telling for you. Forget about it. Okay. <laughs> anyway, yes, ma'am. So, so I think all of you write in more than one genre. A couple of you write short fiction and novel. And Kelly, I think you write for both children and adults. Um, so I'm curious about the process that you go through switching from one genre to another mm -hmm. or how you get the idea of what you want to write. For example, like if you get an idea in your head and you want to write about it, do you know right off the bat that that's a short piece of fiction or if it's a novel or do you, I think you say sometimes you start writing a novel and it doesn't quite get there or you start writing a story and then it turns into a novel, whatever, or you start writing for... Or do you say, I'm going to write short, I'm going to write long, I'm going to write for adults, I'm going to write for kids, I guess you guys get the idea. But how do you kind of start getting an idea, knowing where that idea is going? Um, just how do you decide? Why don't you just tell us about your kind of story novel, and we'll give our, we'll give our prediction. <laughs> I think you, your question described pretty well the way you do it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I, I commend you. <laughs> it, is, it is nice to move back and forth between uh, story lengths or genres because often for me what it means is that I, I have an idea for a story and I'll get one young adult story out of it and one adult story out of it that, that 
I don't know how this is for novelists, but with short stories, I feel like certain kinds of interests or patterns, you think, you, you do it once and you think, I kind of like to do that one again uh, with, a, with a, a different setup or with a different kind of structure. Um, and so you revisit maybe an idea or a set of ideas that came to you that didn't quite fit into the last story, but because you're, you're working with maybe a, a different age range of the character. I think adult story is just a story about somebody who is experiencing something for the first time, which is so broad that a lot of young adult is, is adult literature as, as well. Half the stories in this collection were originally published in young adult anthologies. Um, and the other half are published in adult, but in terms of putting a collection together, you know, they, they fit together and no adult reader has come up to me and said, I read that and you tricked me into reading a, you know, a young adult story. They're just, they're coming of age stories. And I think that's, you know, if you're thinking at least in terms of, you know, young adult, adult, what the divide is, that's really the only, the only thing is, is somebody going through something for the first time, then it's, it, it works in terms of young adult story structure. I am curious though about I, novels, I have to write a novel and I have no idea how you sort of, how something becomes a novel idea rather than a short story idea. I have no idea whatsoever, so it was actually great to hear you reading. Well, if it goes 200 pages, you're gonna call it a novel. <laughs> and, uh, if you wise up and quit at three pages, uh, you call it a failed novel, or you, you let someone call it a story for you. Uh, no, you don't know. Just do, right. do, say what you have to say. Enough said. We are getting the signal that we have to wrap it, to, to wrap it up, but before we do wrap it up, we have uh, author Adam Johnson, we have author Kelly Link, and we have author Paget Powell. Can you please stand on your feet and give them an appreciation for being here and reading for us today?